Hi. Hi, everyone. So we are just going to um, talk about this a little bit with a bit of a handover. So I will talk more about why we need to automate compliance. And Thomas will talk and also demo how we can automate compliance. So the big question that we have is, how can we do open source at scale and speed while staying safe, respect licenses, enable upstream sustainability, and overall make life easier for developers in organizations? It's a very easy ask, right? No pressure at all. <laughs> so most organizations set up an open source program office to support these big asks, whose responsibilities overall include strategizing and managing the open source policy that they have, planning and executing to the strategy, building community and collaboration within the company using InnoSource and also with uh, other open source collaborators outside of the organization, and also more increasingly now tracking and analyzing the validity of the actions that they are doing and improving it. So generally, OSPOs, they have a lot of responsibilities, as we see in that list, a wide variety of tasks, but of course, insufficient funding. So nothing new there. So this is the question that I was basically faced when I started my OSPO. How do you do more with less? Now, being an open source person for a very long time, my approach was simple. Hey, I just use open source. But, hmm, how do I get forward to Snapshot? So I was think, we were thinking about this like, well, we were evaluating tooling, the tooling for basically generally running on an OSPO, how do we scale as an OSPO, right? You have a small team, how do you scale? So then we we're like, hang on, we don't like the tooling that's available in the market, it simply doesn't work for our use cases. And uh, well, I can, we have too sh short a time, but come to afterwards, I can tell you all about all the tooling. So we basically said like, okay, we see in our use case, we need, have built our own tools. There is simply no out. So we say like, okay, let's start with the things that we at the time needed, what is now known as SBOMs and, and licensing, so license compliance. And then we were like, hang on, this is like a hamster wheel. Like we as organizations are using more and more open source. And open source, it's very beautiful, but it's broken in many, many ways. It's like getting free pizza and then you need to make sure that, oh yeah, we can get the pizza, but hang on, somebody, has a peanut allergy. Was peanuts, are there any peanuts were used in when this, in, so you can't do this. So we were looking at this like, okay, okay, so the real problem is actually upstream. We need to fix things upstream, but then we talk, and again, I had a background from the Apache uh, community and also from Mozilla, and they said like, yeah, we don't really have proper tooling for this. And from a principal perspective, most foundations, they don't want to get commercial tools for this. They want to have open source tools. So then I was looking at this, okay, hang on, what if we open source our tooling, then we collaborate with others, then we learn better how to run our own OSPO, and then we slowly do more and more topics that we need as an OSPO. And hang on, if we then all collaborate as OSPOs, basically that means compliance becomes less an issue, and then, hey, OSPOs can help more on contributing back, which helps sustainability. And being an open source guy, <laughs> person myself, Helping project be more sustainable, <laughs> I'm very familiar with that and I really support. So how do I went forward with that? Well, I basically started collaborating in multiple communities and multiple standards. So it comes from the to-do to -do group, where I'm now a steering community member, <laughs> where we work together for Finos, for financial services, to the standards, where you look at uh, uh, Open Chain, that's the ISO standard for, for basically open source compliance. Then I uh, stumbled upon a parent, I made Claire, that spoke this morning, like about inner source. Um, then I went to security, which we now have since, since uh, last year, we have OpenSSF. And finally, for tooling, it, it was still missing, so that's where we built our own tooling called OSS with Toolkit or, or, or for short. So essentially, if you look at an organization which has many different software teams, the using open source software in the organization goes like this. You start and you implement the code change and then you scan. If everything goes well, great, amazing. But life is often not that simple, right? Of sometimes when you scan, then you get a not okay from the scan. And then there are different ways in which you can fix the no to a yes. 
and you can either do a code change, you can either look at the packaging, licensing, and security, and make correction to the scanner tool, essentially tell it that, hey, you know what, actually, you are wrong in this instance because we are not going to use you in use this software in this way, but we are going to use it differently. And also add that information as part of the package. Or if everything else fails, talk to the experts, right? Talk to the open source team, the legal team, the security team, and hopefully one of these approaches pays off. If not, you would need to abort what you're doing. And this is just one software team within an organization doing working like this. And there could be many software teams who are doing the same steps in parallel. So what, uh, what we could do is essentially we can scale the open source software curation process using inner source. Make sure the different software teams within the organization talk to each other, especially when it comes to packaging, package licensing, security correction, because different software teams within the same organization would more often than not end up using the same open source software packages, which would raise the same scan red flags, which could have been sold collaboratively than separately. So let's actually look a little bit more in detail to the, the, the scan bit. And um, we don't have much time, so I'll kind of go on this in a rush phase. So when we looked at this, and it's very, we literally did this in a paper napkin way. It's very, okay, okay, so we have this problem. We need to know what open source is in our, in our, in our software. So first, we, we have this analyzing component that just sucks up what is, what makes a dependency graph of whatever project is being scanned. So then we know like, okay, these and these packages are there. Then basically we're like, okay, we need to do, for multiple purposes, we need to have the source code. Yes, we need it for license compliance to do with copyright and, and license detection, but also think of it from a business continuity perspective. Just because something is currently on the internet doesn't mean it's gonna be in the internet in 20 years. And the way how, and here is basically part of the German automotive industry, cars on the road basically they come with a minimum of 15 years support that you have to be able to figure out security updates and all this stuff. So you need to know exactly what goes in. So if you pull in things via package manager, you need to still be able to do that. My, like I'm running OSPO, my successor of my successor still needs to be able to access that source code. And there's no guarantee that it will be on the internet by then. So once we have a copy of the source code, we can uh, run into a scanner, or it actually doesn't have its own scanner, but it wraps other scanners, both open source and proprietary. Then you can get all the copyright and license information. On the other side, we have a component called the advisor, which takes the same package information and queries like security ad advisory providers, so you get all the security vulnerabilities. Then we smack it together in what we call the evaluator. And the evaluator is also something that's quite unique about ORT. It allows you to write your policy as code. So what I see in a lot of organizations, they have an open source policy, a nice PDF or a Word document on a wiki page. Um, we translate it into code. So that makes it very easy for developers to basically see like, oh, I'm doing something here. They can read the code, what's going on. But more importantly, this is a big problem for us. Our legal counsel said like, you need to do this and this and this, which made from the law perfect sense. But we couldn't implement the tools. The existing tools was all, yeah, either our license is thumbs up or thumbs down. It's like, uh, no, no. So in case you're not familiar with this, large organizations usually lose tens, even of hundreds of thousands of open source package. You cannot do 100% license clearance for all of that. You need to basically do a really a data-driven, risk-driven approach on how you basically clear that. You first start with your high priority ones that are really dangerous and then you work your way down. So you need to have, what we call multiple levels of compliance and how you deal with that. So that's very interesting for evaluator. you can exactly do this. And then we have a variety of reporters. Again, this is, can be as simple as a, a web app reporter that will show or a specific report for your organization. Again, a tool doesn't live in a vacuum. You want to have it integrated with the rest of your organization. And then we have a notifier component if you want to email, send out emails, Jira, et cetera, et cetera. So, just in a quick nutshell, what, the, what is the OSS of Toolkit Ort 
uh, about. So it's actually created by the open source community, by several, actually, uh, a lot of them are German open source program offices that basically all had the same problem. We happened to stumble each other in an open source conference in Prague, and we figured out that we were basically all trying to say to solve the same, so we started working together. Uh, we open sourced the tooling, but also the data and the policies, reference policy, and we're working with other parties to get even more more. The idea is basically that you, I'm, people familiar with licensing, you might see that foundations publish their, what the licenses are approved, not approved. We want to get it in a way that you just publish that as a code that you can just load into ORT, and you can instantly test, like, is my, what I'm licensing using, is this gonna be okay within the Apache Foundation? So, um, for instance, the Eclipse Foundation has now chosen to use ORT for their uh, IP uh, clearance process, and they will do exactly that. They will publish their policy, and then you can test, like if you want to contribute to an Eclipse project, is that going to be acceptable, yes or no? So, it, um, the tool itself does license scanning, security scanning, um, but also, more importantly, what we use it for is best practices or inner source scanning. So, we had all of this data anyways, we have access to all the things, So, and we have a policy as code engine. So, we were just like, hang on, I can also write rules, so like, I want to have a Every project that is open source needs a contributing D, or every industry needs to have a contributing D. In the contributing ND, I would like to have that there is an actual uh, license file. You can write any rules in ORT. You can really you can make this crazy as possible. And finally, of course, you can uh, generate software bill of materials. Now, actually, now let's look a very quick, quick demo. Um, so, if people want to look at the project, the project is on 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 on, on GitHub. And um, my usual recommendation for people to get started, we have a GitHub Action. If most people anyways here in the room uh, or online have a GitHub account, use our GitHub Actions a couple of lines and you can basically get uh, an ORT report, uh, an report action. So uh, here's one running. I will just show the other one. So we support GitHub, also GitLab. So this is, for instance, how you see the output in, in, in GitLab. So from the top, we have so-called notice files. So it's kind of like you want to have a plain text uh, like good old plain text, the lawyers are all familiar with that. Um, but the more interesting thing is actually for us is um, the, what we call the web report. So the, what we wanted to do, you have lots and lots of data. And you need to visualize this and you want to instantly get feedback. Now, a lot of organizations have tools that is like a web server and you need to have access to the web server. We are like, no, no, no. We need to build a tool that we can use in our organization but it's also an open source project upstream can use. And what simpler is it than to create a single HTML file that is integratable the way you've worked for in any CI/CD environment, so any developer knows how to handle it. It's just, a, it's just an HTML file with some JavaScript, they open it up and they can browse the results. Now, now you might wonder, where does this inner source thing come from? Well, lots of tools, they give you all kinds of notifications and they get developer, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you need to fix this. Yeah, that's nice, but you know what your developer will do? Click ignore. That doesn't solve the problem. So the way how we do is we, uh, we develop a workflow where we integrate ORT into, say, GitHub or GitLab, and we really use the workflows that are already there. And then we have a thing called uh, how to fix me text, where if there is a violation thrown, we give them specific to this violation's instructions, like a recipe. This is what you can do to fix that issue. And most of the time, it means that they have to submit a little markdown file via pull request or merge request to a specific repository where th that allows them to fix the issue. Now, this is how we do inner source. So the whole organization, basically, they can start contributing to a shared code repository where all of these tiny little corrections or fixes are, are shared. Now, I can tell you the first time you do it, you'll get absolutely garbage. My experience, you'll get absolutely garbage. And people are like, why are they sending it? And I'm like, yeah, no, no, you have to be patient. Inner source is not a magic person that you snap your fingers and instantly the whole organization magically does. It took us, when we did this originally, four months, but then we saw the numbers going up. So what, well, how our workflow was that basically people send a correction, they get reviewed by our open source program office, and then they get feedback back. And then, because well, I know Claire's lessons, for the people that seen the talk this morning from Claire, you have to encourage people, you have to make them comfortable. So when people submitted basically corrections, the first time were wrong. So then the people in my office were very friendly and say like, yeah, it's wrong, but this and this is what you need to do. 
And lo and behold, after four months, we saw all the time that the time spent to correct these things went down and down to the certain point that at some point, people were sending in 99% correct things. And we're like, cool, this saves us a lot of work. And then these people started to train other people, like, oh, this, still, we, this is easy. You just make, this is, this is the fix. You just make a merge request, and then it gets merged. And then it's, it's very easy. If you see the, the tool going wrong, here is actually the policy file. You can actually read it, and you can exactly figure out that, hey. And then some the developer realized, hang on. This is just like software development. This is like code correction. This is building. I, I get this, this legal stuff. That's what you want to, that's what you want to have. Now, of course, uh, the tool can also produce S-bombs. Uh, lots of people want to have so it's either Cyclone DX or SPX uh, S-bombs. Both flavors are, 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 are available. Uh, maybe a little hint on, on like the policy rules, just to give a sneak preview. You can actually find this all online, because I said we, we have all of this uh, online uh, available, how a rule uh, kind of looks like. So um, this is a dependency rule, and again, it means it runs over every dependency. It basically checks on the, on the linking. Uh, then minus excluded, this is a mechanism where we can figure out like, is a package actually going in my release artifacts or am I using this only for like building, testing or documentation? So you want to separate this out. And then basically we have the next, which is a license rule. So it goes, runs over all the licenses in the package and it says like, oh, is, this, is there a copy left license limited license? Yes, then pff, throw. An error basically saying from, hey, pff, stop. So this is a very flexible mechanism and we're, um, to write whatever rules you want. We have people coming up with all new combinations. So from the org community, we have a couple of reference examples, but we're not going to give you legal advice. That's what we're not allowed to do. <laughs> but we do give you a lot of examples from how you can write these policy rules. And basically, there's a whole community that you can ask, like, how do I do this? Uh, we always say, talk to your lawyer what you want to do with your lawyer, write it out, and then we can help you write draft the, the rules in that case. Um, so we already mentioned some of the, the corrections. I wanted to include a little bit of an example of how you have these kind of corrections. Um, so here you see a tiny little snippet for the Antelier Air 4 package. And here you see some of the things that we fix. This is the, the package declared itself. So the sticker on the outside box says the BSD license. Now, tons of tools will automatically map this to the BSD2 license, the BSD3 license. And we said, like, no. Just a show of hands. How many BSD licenses do people think there are? Five? How many? Five hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah. Every BSD is different because they put the name of the developer in the middle. Yeah, you can say. I, I would say there, there, there is tens of BSD license. So when you write, a, when a developer writes the BSD license, I'm asking like, which license? Well, which one do you mean? Now, commonly it's BSD two, BSD three, but we have to confirm this. And people are like, ah, that's data. Who, who do you care about this? Uh, well. Uh, my users care about this because they come with different obligations. The BSD, the there, there are some of the BSD licenses come with patent obligations. There's a really nice one that says, if you use this package, you give us a worldwide royalty-free license to all the patents that you have as a company. Yeah, most people don't know that. And next one I wanted to show you kind of the other, the other, none of the other mechanisms that we have. So this is basically on where we go for the packages that you include. Again, not everything, because we resolve everything to, down to source. Not everything in the source code repository actually ends up in your release artifact. So we have mechanisms in ORT where you can basically say like, no, no, this is only used for documentation or for, or for testing or for building. So you can separate out what is actually the code that goes into what you're using and what is just in the code repository but what you're not using. Now, people at first will be like, oh, but you're basically placing the developers in kind of the legal seat. It's like, no. The way how ORT is basically designed is that you need to basically be smart in the review workflow. So we generally say, I, I think it's a joke, like developers and lawyers, I call them like they're cats and dogs. They can live in the same house, but they don't speak the same language. Please don't ask your developers to make licensing decisions, split this. And that's what ORT is kind of designed. We ask the developers things that they know. They know things which files are, well, they should know which files are used for documentation, for performance testing. That's what they indicate with a simple YAML file. 
And then on the other side, with the lawyers, we write the policy to basically how that should be handled from a risk perspective. And then ORD basically does the magic handshake between them. That, that's how it uh, is supposed to work. Let's go back. Yeah, so if you want more of ORT, tomorrow we are having our first ever ORT community days. Uh, you can join us remotely, so it doesn't matter wherever you're based in the world. We actually have 50% of the participants joining us remotely. You will be able to uh, have conversations with people from different organizations who are implementing ORT and uh, learn more from them, what worked for them, what they think they could have done better. You would be able to talk to the ORT technical steering committee members and understand from them what are their plans for ORT in the uh, in the coming months and you know for the rest of the year and so on. So definitely if you can make it, if you are interested in learning more about the tool and also understanding how you can contribute better, get involved more, try not to miss it. That's it. Any questions in the room or online? So who was the first one? Uh, then you are. Okay, um, I know from other organizations or organization which is Osadl, they are trying to build a database about confirmed open source library scans, like they did a scan and they confirmed it somehow. Are you planning on something like that? Or I am familiar with the project. So actually what most people might, might not know is that a lot of the open source license compliance tools and security tools, we all know each other and we work together. So actually, you can use, uh, Ozado also publishes a uh, license compliance matrix that is literally built into ORT. So when you write your policy rules, you can say, I want to use the ORT license compliance, uh, the Ozado license compliance rules, and you can, just, you, can, you can use them. So yeah, we know about the project, and we're collaborating uh, with them and how we can see how that, how that fits in. So see ORT is kind of like a... It's really an orchestrator from a lot of other these projects that are doing great things, integrate them together so that you as an organization or an individual open source project, you don't have to do this work anymore. You can just say, I want this done. I can now use it in my project. If you're trying to make this really like as close as turnkey as possible. Again, remember our plan. The easier that we can make it, the, b the better quality the S-bombs will be, the less time people have to spend on license compliance, which means what they can do, they can spend more time on contributing back and make open source better. Okay, so which one? Uh, just for the record, um, I know we had a discussion over lunch, but do you feel like this toolkit could be applied to other kinds of formalized information, like contact information of the people operating the project or whom to call in case of a vulnerability? Uh, yes. So the tools are relatively flexible, so that we, we use their emails. Um, we have used it in our organization, for instance, when we migrate, migrate services. You can write a rule, say, so like, you're not, we're, we're this, imagine that we're migrating from GitLab to GitHub. You can really write a rule like that. Or imagine you want to have a security TXT file in every code repo every open source project. You can write, I want every file, every code repository to have a security TXT file, and I want it to have this format context. You can do that. It's, it's not, 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 not a problem. We can just automate it, it becomes a policy rule, and if people don't uh, thank you, we can literally show them the problem like, oh, you don't have a security TXT, a security TXT should look like this and have this contents. There you find the reference. Again, it's think about a small team scaling out. Writing things down is great, but having a tool that basically, as a, as a, for developers, as a linter, say, thumbs up, thumbs down, and if it's thumbs down, it instantly tells you, this is how you can fix it. Developers love that. Instead of having a tool where it says stop, and it says, like, please read our 400-page wiki page. You know what a developer does? Too long, don't read. Ignore. <laughs> Um, a lot of source code is not 
correctly documented in terms of licensing. For example, the license actually is not in the source code or even, not even a reference. Some of the loads of projects in Ruby, which have a tradition of not putting any form yep. of license information in the source code. So if you don't actually download the whole repo, you have no idea what that license will be. Does our does Ort kind of like solve that, or does it throw up as an error and then you have to fix it and yep. you, you it, then it, upstream that into some repository where that information yeah, is so kept? Yeah, so it will throw, of course, a policy violation. Uh, basically saying, from there's no license for this. And then, of course, the way from the ORP project, our philosophy is like, look, what has already been released cannot be patched up and fixed. This is why we have the so-called curation mechanism where we can make corrections and we can tell what the right license is. In the same how to fix me text, uh, if an organization really wants to contribute, they can also write to their people like, hey, if this is broken and this is the current bleeding edge, please go upstream and make a merge request or pull request to fix it upstream. Because upstream can still be fixed. The latest version probably, can, if the same issue exists, you can be fixed. But what has been released, yeah, you, you can't fix it. So that's why ORT has this two max. But again, from the ORT project, we're not dictating that. We're not, we're very, we're just a facilitator. We recommend people to do this because generally if everybody fixes things upstream, it makes it better for the whole community. But it's not on us to, enforce that or force that, but yeah, we do have examples that tell you this is how you could do it. It depends on the policy of the organization, right? Okay, so one last question, maybe. Any questions from I have to look. <laughs> <laughs> it did not work. Can you, so do you pull all the licensing information, the copyright notices from the repos online to get them, if they're not there? you release? So, so do, do we pull in all of the, the license information uh, uh, yeah, for online? Uh, yes, we do. So if people want to compare tools, uh, this is a trick that most tools cannot do. Where it, they will tell you maybe they have this easily in packaging your code, but what they can't do is they can show you exactly what are the license findings for this particular package. And they can also, not, usually they cannot exactly tell you where did we get from, what was scanned. So we designed ORT kind of as a software project as well, it's end-to-end -end traceable. So we know exactly the whole provenance part, how do we get a panzer, what was scanned, which scanner was used, which parameters were used for the scanner, so that for us basically as the ORT developers ourselves, when a user comes in with an issue, we ask them for the ORT result file and we can exactly recreate uh, uh, that, that case. So this is also when uh, I said, <laughs> I work in high compliance industry. <laughs> when there is an issue, um, again, you can never do 100% perfect compliance. This is simply impossible. But if there is an incident and something went wrong, we can trace down exactly where it goes wrong and we can prove you, this is our, end again, you need to implement in your own organization, but from our perspective, we can trace down exactly what our version was done, which tools were done, and then we can identify, oh, this is where it went wrong. Okay, now Martin, who's one of the maintainers in here in the room, he's like, oh, I can fix that. I make a pull request, he can fix it. And then basically we can, so like, okay, this is our broken, this is how we fixed it. So that's what you won't see with any other tools. Okay, thanks a lot. And yes, we have a question from online. Uh, how is the best practice to dealing with containers and constraints there? Ooh. Could you do it? Uh, <laughs> I, I get that question often a lot. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to tell a hard truth that most people don't want to list. You can't do proper license compliance for containers. It is purely not possible. Why? Because containers were designed not to retain that information. It's a bunch of black box binaries stuck together. So the best thing that you can do is, uh, well, what the most tools on the market, they do kind of fingerprinting, and they are, we think that looks, that looks kind of there at the end there. But yeah, you, there's some material from the Linux Foundation as well, from Armin Hamel on, on, on containers. I would suggest people to read that. You can't do it. So what are your options? If you want to do it properly, uh, you a, either A, build your uh, um, Docker image completely from scratch, which kind of defeats the purpose of using Docker containers, or B, which is actually nicer, um, there is this nice little startup called ChainGuard, <laughs> and they're, at least, they're releasing uh, uh, base uh, Docker containers for a lot of the things that actually come with an SBOM included. Uh, so their whole pitch is basically providing Docker containers with SBOMs and zero uh, for known vulnerabilities. And then you can use that as your base. The problem that you then still have, then you have your base Docker image, but then your developers, and this is where it mostly goes wrong, 
your developers will go in and what they will do is they write to their own Docker file and they will do like, oh, I need this particular thing. Let me just do curl fetch random binary from the internet and stuck it in my Docker file. So yeah, you, it's a combination. So if you want to do containers properly and do license compliance properly, uh, you need to basically have the right basis, have the right processes in place to handle this. So a common question actually we kind of like, why is there no published container for ORT available? Uh, well, you can read the issue, but it's actually very simple. It's really, 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 really hard to make a fully licensed compliance uh, Docker container. We have one guy who's currently who's working for uh, Caveat, so that's a Volkswagen's. Uh, I didn't, he's been working on it for months. Literally, it's incredibly complex to get the complete corresponding source code for Docker. Building a Docker image, five minutes, no problemo. Figuring out what's actually in it, a multi-month journey. Because we said, like, we're, we're, we want to do things properly. The least what we can do as a tool is try to publish a, a compliant Docker image. We are probably going to get there 85 or 90 percent of the way. Uh, the rest we can't do, simply because we, for instance, support the Android SDK. And, um, well, you should really look into how the Android SDK is published and where the sources are for the Android SDK. You're going to be surprised uh, about that case. So that's where we say, like, yeah, we'll publish whatever information Google gives us, but, yeah, the rest, we cannot do it. So our, even our, like, and we tried, we tried for many months, our, even ours is going to be incomplete. Uh, but that's basically the currently the state of the world. I don't like it, but trust me, we're working really hard. As I said, I lead uh, the security profile in SPDX, so I'm working again on the SPX standard to improve this, to make better tooling. But most software in the world was developers are happy that it compiles. It was not designed for generating S-bombs. So this is basically, I always compare this, think of it, you go to the supermarket, and whatever, you, you know, when you pick something from a supermarket, it always has an ingredients list. Think of that we are in a world without an ingredients list on, on, say, a jar of peanut butter. And now say that everybody now has a magic regular model, like we should do ingredients list. And everybody, we should really do ingredients list. And everybody wants it now. Do you think the food manufacturers are able to do this overnight? This is exactly with the software, the, the whole software community. No, it's, it's not possible. For years and years, we've built software, and every developer is happy if it just builds. Now you come over to the primary that you actually want to know what's in there. Like, I'm a software developer myself. I'm happy when my freaking thing compiles. Now you want me to figure out what actually goes in there? I don't know how the compiler works. That's like a black box magic. Thanks a lot. <laughs>